Good evening. I'm Lee Sexisa, the Executive Director of the NASBA Center for the Public Trust. Thank you all for being here tonight as we honor Susan, Carol, and Michael. The NASBA Center for the Public Trust focuses on promoting ethics, affirming and encouraging what's right, showcasing best practices, and promoting the positive. We achieve these goals through a number of programs, such as ethics and leadership conferences and seminars, communications that tell the good news, college chapters that instill strong ethical values in our future business leaders, and the CPT Being a Difference Award. The Being a Difference Award program recognizes individuals who epitomize the highest standards of social responsibility and ethical leadership. Susan, Carol, and Michael truly embody the principles of this award. They don't simply aspire to make a difference, they are being a difference. Many of us dream of doing some good in the world, while others wake up and work hard at it. I know you'll agree that these three are the ones who wake up and work hard. We have a very special guest tonight, Colonel Jeffrey Colt. He's going to share his personal experiences how the selfless work of Susan, Carol, and Mike has affected thousands of men and women who've put their lives on the line to protect our country. Before I introduce Colonel Colt, I'd, love, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank some of the other guests for their involvement and for being with us tonight. Firstly, and Mike and Carol don't know about this, I want to thank the Congregation Rodea Shalom, for they have made a generous donation in Mike and Carol's honor to the NASBA Center for the Public Trust. For making a special effort to join us tonight, I'd like to thank NASBA CEO David Costello and his wife Sally, who arrived this morning from Nashville. Connecticut State Board Executive Director David Gay, Connecticut State Board members Tom Reynolds and Len Romanello, Michael's partner and his family, the Winnicks, and a special thank you to Bernadette Baldino and the Easton Public Library for providing this beautiful space for us to gather. I now have the privilege of introducing Colonel Jeffrey Fault, who after spending the night with the son in the emergency room tending to a broken arm, <laughs> left his home in Nevada, had a flight canceled, had an unexpected layover in Minnesota, and then spent more than 36 hours traveling here to be part of this evening. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Colonel Colt is the Commander Joint Unmanned Aircraft System Center of Excellence at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. This is direct reporting unit to the Commander U.S. Joint Forces Command, operationally focused on developing joint UAS employment and training standards. Colonel Colt's brigade was the first to receive the gift bags from Mike Carroll and Susan. We told him, when we told him how honored we would be that he could join us tonight to present this award, his remark was, it's my honor to be here. And with that, please welcome Colonel Jeffrey Clark. Thank you, first of all, for the warm welcome and the kind introduction. It's, a, it's both an honor and a privilege of mine to be here with you this evening. And it's an honor to be with an organization like NASBA that uh, exhibits and, and upholds such high professional standard and obviously goes the distance well and beyond to recognize deserving people, their contributions and efforts. And in that regard, I think our organizations, the United States Army, your armed forces, and NASBA share a lot of, of these uh, characteristics. It's also a great pleasure to be with my dear friends the Wine Schultz and Dr. Sue, and to see that Mike, Carol, and Sue get some of the recognition I think they truly deserve. Uh, they're remarkably generous, and these efforts really made a difference. And it's always a great privilege, obviously, to wear the uniform and represent the nation's armed forces. And speaking of wearing the uniform tonight, I tell you, I usually receive quite a few comments about uh, how the uniform looks, and most people actually are a little bit puzzled when they look at me and they're thinking, blue, isn't this guy in the army? Aren't they supposed to be green? And, and, well, this, this, is, this is traditional and this is where your army is going. We're going to one uniform and it's going to be blue. There also seems to be a lot of times when people are looking at the uniform, they have a lot of curiosity about the badges and the accoutrements that are hung on it. And I would tell you that for some reason tonight, should you hear me mutter, you know, damn it or something like that, excuse me, it's, uh, it's these little 
brass clasps that hold all these things <laughs> in place. Military people affectionately call these things damn it's and our spouses do too, because inevitably throughout the night one of them pops off and somebody comes up to you and they're looking at you kind of strange and sir your thing is crooked or sir you're dangling. So that's 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 really what it, what it's all about. But I can assure you also that uh, anybody who ever chastises their spouse about taking a long time to get ready to go out for an evening, I assure you, you ought to try to put on one of these get-ups, all right? I can assure you that nobody pokes, prods, pushes, or measures more for a night on the red carpet than I did. Well, I'm obviously not here to talk about my issues getting dressed or how I look. Uh, I really just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about something that I think I have a passion for, and that's selfless volunteers, soldiers, families, and their supporters. I think it's amazing that we go through the course of our daily lives and uh, just how many people we come in contact with and how many we really do or don't connect with, each engagement never really knowing what the impact of that moment or that engagement might ultimately lead to. Uh, I think we realize that the world is becoming uh, more interconnected uh, every minute, every day. Globalization is real, and we're connecting with more people every day. The complexity in the environment we live in is obviously becoming more complex every day. Our nation is a global leader, and we have global responsibilities. And few things that I know are true absolutes, and I don't think are you know, the complexity and the integration of the world is something that's likely to change in our, our children's lifetimes. As a result of this growing complexity and uncertainty, preserving and protecting the values in our way of life is more challenging now than perhaps ever before. And I think it's likely that it may become even more challenging in the future. In many respects, technology enables us to do increasingly amazing things, whether in business or national security. I see this in my job out at Creech every day where there are serious discussions about how to replace humans with drones. In fact, we see that drones are in the news all the time now. With that said, I, must most seriously, I think most serious-minded people must con uh, confess that humans are much more and more important than hardware and that people will always be the difference, the edge, the advantage. It seems incredible that we just recently witnessed the 8th anniversary of 9-11. It's an important reminder of the dangers we face and the selfless sacrifices so many make. 9-11 was clearly a strategic inflection point, a relatively brief moment in time that changed our lives right before our very eyes, and in many ways, an event that provided us perhaps a glimpse of the uncertainty and volatility of the future. Over the, eight, over the past eight years, beginning shortly after 9-11, our armed forces, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, all volunteers. Think about that. Our volunteers have been engaged halfway around the world in Southwest Asia for almost eight years. The nation engaged in the longest war with an all-volunteer force since the Revolutionary War. A higher percentage of moms and dads are serving in a conflict than any time in our recent history. More than 40% of the parents, more than 40% of the military are parents, and over 230,000 children have a mother or father at war. A generation of kids has, has had a parent deployed at least once, and many times, in most cases, more than once. A Pentagon survey earlier this year of over 13,000 military spouses of active duty service members recently found that children most affected by these deployments are between the ages of 6 and 13. The empty seat at the dinner table night after night is the constant reminder of the child's worry for safety of his or her parent. Even in peacetime, military kids face special circumstances such as moving every time their mom and dad receive a new assignment. <clears throat> but the parents appreciate their service today because they know they'll pay dividends tomorrow. When the nation calls on them to go to difficult and dangerous places, they answer knowing that what they do will protect the loved ones they've left behind. 
Again, this is the longest engagement made by our volunteer forces since the Revolutionary War. The Great World War I, World War II, Korea, the Untold War, Vietnam, the Forgotten War, were fought largely by conscripted forces. Think about that, eight years, smallest force since perhaps the post-World War I era, continuously gauged on the front lines of the, on the War of Terror, and our all-volunteer forces engaged daily around the world, building and reinforcing partnerships, and when at home, they're still training and attending professional education. I simply can't say enough about the intelligence, agility, strength, resilience, and patience of our soldiers and their families. These soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines deploy selflessly and irrespectively of the larger policy and strategy debates that play out in the media almost every week. They're not policymakers. They're not trained diplomats. They're dedicated volunteers, supported by very dedicated families, just like ours. In fact, I know the wine shells understand this clearly, as their son Matt, who I've commanded twice, is in Afghanistan tonight. Over the past eight years, it's been my privilege to have commanded soldiers and cared for their families four times. That included multiple deployments to both Afghanistan and Iraq. And if I spoke to you all night long, I don't think I could ever tell you the impact and extraordinary accomplish accomplishments of your all-volunteer force. Exposed to danger every day, your young men and women in uniform have assisted standing up local governance, building more roads, opening schools, planting more crops, and providing more preventative medical care than firing weapons. They have and continue to adapt remarkably well to the new realities of irregular warfare and counterinsurgency operations, the most complex and imaginable situations in places and in languages most of us can't pronounce. In an age and an era where entertainers and overpaid athletes are too often referred to as heroes, these soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and their supportive families are, are making real sacrifices every day. Tonight, we recognize Mike, Carol, and Sue for some exceptional support to soldiers and families. It was back in the beginning, back in 2000, when I met the wine shells. First, their son, Matt, when he was assigned to my squadron in the 82nd Airborne Division. And at the time, I met Mr. Leon, Miss Sylvia, Mike, and Carol. Their genuine care and concern was evident. I had 317 troopers in my squadron at the time. And though I had met many parents of soldiers before, at, that moment, at the moment we met, I knew something was different. But I had absolutely no idea just how engaged they would become and what an impact they'd make in my and my soldiers' lives. Throughout 2003 and 2004, Mike and Carol had two, two of their sons, many of you probably know them, Matt and Randy, who were both serving in Iraq. At the time, Matt was in my Special Operations Battalion, Randy, I believe, was serving, serving with a historic 101st Airborne Division. And I can't tell you what it means to a commander to know that you have the trust of parents, particularly when you're in harm's way with their kids. Well, now flash forward to the summer of 2005, literally standing in my mother-in-law's kitchen in Clarksville, Tennessee. Carol asks, how can she support my brigade for its deployment to Iraq? At this point, I'm thinking, does Carol really understand how big a combat aviation brigade task force is? <laughs> I didn't think so. It's literally 10 times larger than the squadron I commanded when we met. And it's four or five times larger than the battalion that Matt and I served in in special operations in 2003 and 4. So you're getting this thing 10 times bigger. When Carol originally asked, you know, what I thought about that, I, I, you know, I really had to kind of, I had to take pause, and again, I wasn't sure how to answer that. Maybe I should fudge on the number, you know. But uh, I, I actually, Andrew, you know, I got up the courage and I answered candorously. I said, Carol, about three thousand. Actually, it was closer to four thousand. I fudged. Well, as most of you know, Carol. 
she literally, all she did was blink her bright eyes, and she looked at me, and she responded with something that almost sounded like California. It wasn't like, but it was oh. And, uh, and at that point, I, I knew that her oh meant, oh, definitely, I'll do this. And I can't tell you what it's like to spend a year away in combat. I've spent uh, about five of them. Uh, I've spent five holiday seasons, Christmas, Thanksgiving, etc., birthday, anniversary, deploy. You just can't imagine what the reaction of soldiers is when they receive things like this. What I do know is <clears throat> it's difficult sometimes to embrace the needs and emotions of others. And I assure you that it's, if you think it's difficult on a 1v1, try it on a 1v4000. And that's exactly what they did. Four holidays, individually wrapped gifts, cards, letters, extraordinary people that we recognize here tonight behind me. I honestly don't have any idea how many units Mike, Carroll, and Sue have embraced since then, but I'm sure their generosity and selflessness can be repaid. Since 2003, wine shows have had the one son at least, Matt, uh, deployed almost continuously, either in or in direct support of combat operations. They've literally supported thousands of soldiers and families they've never met and never asked for a single thing in return. And what began, I think, is a very generous gesture has become a, a mission of passion. And, and what more can you say? These days, we hear a lot about society, for the most part, is not involved in the war effort. Most citizens are not directly affected by the ongoing conflicts. Well, there's an element of truth in all that, but in making them those statements, there's a tendency to overlook all the good that is being done on behalf of our troops and the work that's being done, such as those of the people sitting behind me again, the compassionate and selfless citizens across the nation. Winston Churchill once said, you make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. Mike, Carol, and Sue, you've made a wonderful life. You're much too proud of your example for the whole country. And in my view, you're very special heroes. So thank you again for this honor time. <clears throat> it's a privilege to be with people is they, uh, they care for the next best generation. Thank you again. And we all appreciate them because we know, first of all, how much you love Sue, Carol, and Mike, Michael, as they love you. And uh, I couldn't help, I mean, I'm sure you felt the same. Uh, this is America on display, isn't it? <laughs> and you're, I, I love towns like Houston. Uh, Sally and I live in a small place in Tennessee called Franklin. Franklin, uh, some of you may know, David, uh, we were talking about Civil War history. Franklin's one of those towns, Easton's one of those towns. And it just, it's America at its best. And thank you so much for uh, privilege, sir. Uh, thank you. Honoring us with those words. Uh, gosh, I, 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 I've thrown away all the notes. I'm just going to talk to you about uh, what we're doing here and why we're so privileged to, to honor Susan and Michael and Carol Knight. NASVA is the National Association, State, National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. I'm not going to bore you with all everything we do. We do a lot. Uh, we are the membership organization for the Connecticut Board of Accountancy, which is represented by 
these people over here and uh, 54 other boards of accountancy. They, they try to keep an eye on the CPAs and the licensed accountants throughout the country, and that's a good thing. Uh, and, and, and we're pleased with the work that NASP does. We try to help boards be more effective in protecting the public, protecting uh, your investments, protecting your confidence in CPAs. But one of the things that we're the most proud of is the Center for the Public Trust. Back around the turn of the century, you, you may remember uh, the Enrons, uh, the Adelphias, the WorldComs, things were going crazy as they did just recently, you know, again. And people, you, others, I, we lost confidence in, in CEOs, we lost confidence in chief financial officers, we lost confidence in CPAs, attorneys, institutions. People just lost confidence. And it was unfortunate because what we saw in the accounting community, in the CPA community, is CPAs who are to be trusted, like your minister, like your doctor, all of a sudden people say, I don't trust you. And, and, and we, we, we dug into that and we found that it's only a small, tiny percentage of people, including CPAs, who don't get it right. They actually intend to do something wrong. Most CPAs, like you, you and I, they, uh, they go to work every day. They want to do a good job. They want to protect the public interest. That's what they're about. They're, they're like Michael Weinstein, who's a CPA. They're like others of you. They're like Tom there. And, and they want to get it right. So maybe there's a half a percent, I don't know, who, who blow it, who just get it wrong. We said, you know, all the Fox News and CNN and all the papers, they're, all they're doing is telling a story about who gets it wrong. My goodness, isn't it about time to shift the focus and talk about people like Michael and Carol who get it right in the communities and do things that Colonel Cole just described that is part of what is, makes up the fiber of, of America? Yeah. So that's what we decided to do in the Center for the Public Trust. Some people said, well, Dave, what does the Center for the Public Trust have to do with NASA's mission in enhancing the effectiveness of boards? Well, if we lose trust, if we lose confidence, we don't need a Board of Accountancy. We don't need a NASBA. So it's at the heart and soul of what we do. Ethics, honesty, integrity. So that's what we're about. So we, uh, we developed and created this organization, Center for the Public Trust, and one of our tremendous programs is recognizing individuals such as Susan, Carol, and Mike for being a difference. Now, being a difference is a carefully chosen descriptor. It's not making a difference. So you can make a difference one or two times. That's good. But being a difference is a lifestyle. It's not just a one-time event. It's not just once a month event. It's a lifestyle event. So that's what we're about. I am, uh, and I'm probably going to blow this, but I'm going to try. I haven't recited this poem in a long time. <laughs> but I'm going to try. And if I blow a line or two, you'll understand. But this poem came to my mind when I was thinking about Susan and Carol and Michael and what they've done. Some of you may recognize it's called The Builder. It goes like this. I saw them tearing a building down, a gang of men in a busy town. With a whole heap hole and a lusty yell, they swung a beam and a sidewall fell. I asked The Builder, are these men skilled and the ones you'd hire if you had to build? He said, laughed and said, no indeed. Common labor is all I need for. I could easily wreck in a day or two but it's taken builders years to do. I thought to myself as I walked away, which of these roles am I trying to play? Am I a builder with a ruling square, exercising all that you care? Or am I building my life, a well-laid plan, trying to do the best I can? Or am I a wrecker who stalks the town, content with the labor of tearing down? And I thought about Susan, Michael, and Carol. I said, you know what? They're, they're those builders. They've built their lives by well they plan. They thought about what they were doing as you described, Colonel. They thought about it, and they were purposeful about what they were doing. No, they're not content with tearing down anything. And you know, that's most of us. But you know, if you listen to CNN, if you read the New York Times, and that's all you digest, you think everybody's that out here trying to tear things down. That's not what it is. America is about building up. America is, a, is about the Susans and the Carols and the Michaels. People 
who are not tearing down stuff, but building things up. I'm tremendously proud just to be a part of this award ceremony that recognizes three individuals who have determined that they're going to do something. And just as, as Colonel Cole told you about uh, Carol's reaction when he said 4,000, it wouldn't have made, if you'd said 40,000, the answer would have been the same, I bet you. <laughs> it wouldn't have made a difference because that's who they are. That's who you are. That's who we all are trying to be. So Susan, Carol, and Michael, y'all come up here and join me. We want to recognize you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. This one says, this is to Susan Spivak. Uh, did I pronounce yes, that right? Wow. That good. <laughs> well, I am. You're a doctor. So I have to be careful around no, you. Know, that's it. We are just pleased and honored to award this Being a Difference Award to you, Susan. Thank you so much for being a part of this tremendous. <laughs> Nazareth's finest and most popular ladies is Carol Weinstein. Carol, congratulations on such a great. <laughs> the more I'm around Michael Weinstein, the more I respect him, the more I love him. He's a tremendous American. Thank you, Michael. let them get away without saying something. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the podium over to Michael, Carol, and Susan. When Matthew went to Korea in 1997, I began baking and sending cookies weekly. Our family and friends often commented that I was baking for the entire United States Army. <laughs> Little did I know where I was going. Quickly I learned that many soldiers received nothing from home. How sad was that? And then when Randy went to Iraq in 2003, it was the same story. Our son shared with those who got nothing. So when Colonel Colt took the 159th Combat Aviation Brigade to Iraq in October of 2005, <coughs> It was easy to ask Sue if she wanted to adopt this brigade. She quickly said yes, and the rest is history. We began with 2,850 soldiers, and as of today, have adopted over 8,000. I can't say that I have baked for all of them, but I can <laughs> certainly say that Sue, Mike, and I have sent packages to each one of them. To you who are here tonight, we thank you. You have supported our efforts and enjoyed hearing our stories and the words of appreciation we received by email and through letters from our adopted troops. You answered our call and you volunteered your resources without being asked. You never let us down. Nothing has been more memorable for me personally than a standing ovation by over 800 soldiers and their families at the 159th Military Ball. These soldiers stood for us. It is we who should be standing for them. Look at who their commander was at the time. We owe Colonel Colt a debt of gratitude for his leadership, his insight, his patience, and most importantly for the <coughs> In all honesty, and I know I speak for Mike and Sue, we cannot show enough appreciation for the soldiers and their families as they give selflessly on our behalf. The honor tonight belongs to our military, for they are the ones who are being the difference. 
Somehow, I don't feel like a hero. Our heroes are really our soldiers deployed, and our heroes are really you and Colonel Cole. You have supported our projects, and with your support, you have helped us to achieve this mission. It seems a little old feisty lady got pulled over by a rookie police officer. The rookie police officer said to her, I think you were speeding. She replied, I was? He said, let me see your license. She replied, I don't have a license. I lost it four years ago for drunken driving. <laughs> he said, let me see your registration. She said, I don't have a registration. I stole this car. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I stole this car, I killed the driver and I chopped up his body, and I stuffed it in plastic bags in the trunk. <laughs> At which point this rookie police officer backed away from the car, got into his car, and called for backup. <laughs> Five police cars arrive. The senior police officer comes back to the lady and says, um, would you get out of the car, please? She said, certainly. He said, uh, would you mind opening the trunk? She said, not at all. She goes back and she opens the trunk. It's empty. He says to her, says, this police officer told me that you said you had a chopped up body in the trunk. She said, he said, may I see your Registration. Shows it. She takes out the registration, gives it to the officer. He's now getting very confused. He said, May I see your license? She said, Here's my license. He examines it. Perfectly good license. He says to her, He said, I don't know what to tell you. That police officer just told me you stole this car, you didn't have a license, you had a chopped up body in the trunk. At which she replied, I bet that liar police officer told you I was speeding. <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about NASBA. Uh, David already did, and the State Board. Um, it's really an organization there to protect the public and to uphold ethics and enforcement for those small number of CPAs and licensees who do things wrong. And, and they really do a good job. Um, again, I'd like to recognize my fellow board members. Um, they, they make a difference and, and they give every day. And uh, Lisa told you a little bit about the Center for Public Trust. Again, um, I, I'm often perplexed why we need such an organization. I mean, after all, majority of Americans and CPAs are good people. Why, why do we have to 
take the time to show that basically people are good. And I guess the real reason is because the bad people are the ones getting in the headlines. We read about Madoff, we read about Enron. Um, that, that's good. A uh, small minority of less than probably 1%, but they seem to get all the press. I also would like to thank Colonel Culp. Um, we realized it took him 33 hours to get here. <laughs> Perhaps um, when he's done his career, he can uh, go to work for Northwest Airlines. <laughs> him out. It, it seems ironic that it took him longer to get from Las Vegas to here than it takes our soldiers to get from the East Coast to Afghanistan. <laughs> um, he really is a man with vision, passion, upbeat, and a terrific leader. And, and our country is lucky to have him. Uh, and as you probably could guess, we kind of have a mutual admiration society and a love affair going. <laughs> he, he, he's really part of our family, and, and he thinks likewise. And, and I'm just so honored that he would, you know, take out the time and be here with us. I also would like to thank Sue. Um, I don't know how many of you have been in our house, but our playroom kind of is a combination of Walmart, Costco, and BJ's. <laughs> all in one. And, uh, Every once in a while, we come home and we realize there's things gone from that warehouse and Sue sneaks in and takes some stuff and leaves some stuff and um, she, she's just been a tremendous uh, part of this project and we really appreciate it. Finally, um, not finally, but <laughs> I want to thank my wife, the ever ready battery. I <laughs> you know, L Lou Gehrig said, today I am the luckiest man in the world. I really think I am the luckiest man. She also has that passion, as, as you can tell. Um, many mornings at 4 o'clock in the morning, she'll pull on my sleeve and say, I'm going down the back. You want to go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also want to thank Bernadette. Thank Lisa and Jen. And finally, I want to thank all of you. Um, I can look around this room and I could probably spend five to ten minutes on each of you because you're all wonderful people, good people, making a difference yourself. And uh, you give us inspiration uh, by, by your support of both money and time and not only this project, but in the community. And, and I see some of my friends on Bridgeport Hospital and uh, 
I'm also very involved in VNS, and all these people have uh, sort of the same thing in common, the passion and, and the upbeat and the leadership to uh, make a difference and do the mission. Uh, some, sometimes I wonder why it takes a crisis to rally us. Uh, it took 9-11, took Katrina. Um, it shouldn't, but sometimes it does. But looking around this room, usually it doesn't take that crisis. You're all out there doing good things and doing the right things. And for that, I'm grateful to you. Uh, we have a responsibility to pass that message on to our children and to our grandchildren and to their children. So, uh, and I know looking around this room, we're passing that message along. Finally, I guess this reward really a piece of it belongs to each of you, but I'm not going to break it up. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, I thank you. Uh, God bless our troops. God bless our leaders. God bless you. Great evening, hadn't it? <laughs> when you can honor people you love, you see that they are a great example of service. It's just been a tremendous evening. I'm, I want to close uh, this evening uh, with a rallying cry for all of us. Uh, Shel Silverstein is, is one of my very favorite poets. He also wrote some great books. You can find them out here in the library in the children's section. <laughs> Called The Giving Tree is one of them, where the sidewalk ends is one of them. In fact, I think this little poem came out of, out of the where the sidewalk ends. He titles it Orchestra, not orchestra, but O-U-R, orchestra. Okay, orchestra, all playing together. This is what Shell says. So you haven't got a drum, just beat your belly. <laughs> so I haven't got a horn, I'll play my nose. So, so we don't have any cymbals, we'll just slap our hands together. And though there may be orchestras that sound a little better, with their fancy, shiny instruments that cost an awful lot. Hey, we're making music twice as good because we play just what we got. That's all we're asking everybody to do. Just play what you got. Just use your abilities. Just use what God has given you individually. Work together and do just a little thing. What, what uh, Sue and Carol and Michael did, they started out just doing what they could playing what they got. So let's all commit to that. Let's just decide we're going to do what we can by playing what the, with what the good Lord gave each one of us to whatever degree we can. We just appreciate so much you being here tonight. Thank you, and you have a great weekend. Thank you.